for you. I was up at four o'clock this morning. Anybody else up that early? Anybody, anybody? How many are morning people? Raise your hand. Man, that's, of course, you're in the first service. <laughs> how many, how many are night hawks and you just, how many are both? You just, you don't sleep. There's a few of you. I don't understand how you do that, but uh, I'm a morning person. My wife is a big night hawk and we got married and uh, that's typically how it goes. But I want to tell you, I was praying for you, and I have been praying for you, um, and I do pray for you, my wife and I, every day, that God would cover you, that God would protect you, that God would give you more than you need so that you could be the biggest blessing you could be. And one of the things I pray for you is influence. I'm asking, and I have been asking, for you to have influence in your world, influence in your school, influence in your business. Influence in your, your realm and your family and community. And what I've been so excited about is God has been answering those prayers. So many of you have been telling me about how God is promoting you, how God is getting you, pushing you forward into rooms that you never thought you'd be in, and that God is giving you a voice to people to breathe life into them, that this is what it's about. Now, there are different realms and different areas of our life. There's the church a, uh, realm, there's business realm, there's healthcare, there's education, there's entertainment, all that. How many know we should never just be on our church hill and acquiesce all the other hills? God's called us to be influential in all of the world. And if you've been following me for any length of time, you know that I've developed a program called Killer Culture Academy. It's, to really, it's something that I felt the Lord call me into to help business people. And it's, it's all about dysfunctional team culture, building that for them. So you're going to start seeing some of this because I feel like God has gifted me with leadership. I feel like God has given me um, a little bit of insight into helping businesses thrive. And really, guys, it's a tool for me to share my faith. If you add enough value to anybody, at the, after a while, you'll earn the right to share your faith. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. Now, having said that, as you are watching me post some of these things, I want to, as your pastor, be very clear. Please never feel any obligation to, to take any of these programs that I'm doing uh, for these businesses. I don't want you to feel like, man, there's an expectation on you because you're, you're in our church. I never want you to feel that awkwardness, and I just needed to say that up front. I do feel like I have to steward the gift God's given me and try to reach as many people as possible. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. I have been praying about what to speak the week after Easter, and it was so funny because I had this text, Acts chapter 1, in my mind. And when I sat down to write the sermon for this week, I, op I just let my Bible fall open, and guess where it landed? Acts chapter 1. Now, I don't typically play the Bible roulette game. I don't recommend you do that. I believe in a systematic study of the Scriptures. Uh, you can get very dangerous if you're just like, God, give me a word, give me a word, give me a word, and you point to a verse. You ever tried that? One guy tried that, and it didn't work out too good. <laughs> He opened it up with his Bible. He, he said, God, I just, I, whatever I point my finger to is going to be the word from God. And he was like, Judas went out and hung himself. Oh, okay. He said, let's try this again. Open it up to another scripture. It says, go do likewise. Mm, this is not from you, Lord. This is not. Just got to be very careful with that. I believe that we should be reading the Bible every day. And many times, I get it. Sometimes when we're desperate, like you just want you know, you're praying silly prayers like, Lord, if it's you, turn the blender on, you know, <laughs> open the Bible, just whatever verse is going to be there, it's going to jump out at me. I, I believe we should be reading it every day. And if you are reading it every day, God is so good. He will take what you read. And later that day, you will either tell it to somebody else to help them, or you'll say, this is exactly what I've been needing. And year after year after year of studying the scripture, reading the Bible, it compounds and you begin to fill your heart with the Word of God, and pretty soon, when you're in a decision-making environment, you don't have to ask, well, man, well, I don't even know what to do. You, a verse will come back to your mind, and God will give you what you need in that moment. But we got to fill our lives up with the Bible, because we are filling our lives up with so much other junk, 
And so when it comes to a decision, the word of God and God's voice is so quiet compared to what other voices we have elevated. And pretty soon we're like, man, I have a decision. Well, sh should I take the worldly philosophy that I heard at work? Should I take the, the Facebook post that someone said? Should I take my, my upbringing? We have to elevate the word of God and God's word will direct our paths. Amen, somebody. Amen. Having said that, in looking at the resurrection last weekend, what an amazing weekend it was. And I begin to think about what the disciples must have felt when they were there. And we have a second Wednesday service that's coming up this Wednesday. You don't want to miss that. And at 7.30, get here early because these have been real special. We're going to take communion to remember the death and the resurrection of Christ this Wednesday night, all right? Then we have our West Conference. Fill this out for anybody and, and get your ticket like today. Don't put it off. Get it today. April the 19th and the 20th. Some incredible speakers. This place is going to be jam-packed. But here's our verse. Acts chapter 1. He says, in my former book, this is the very first word, very first sentence. Who's talking here? The guy's name is Luke. Dr. Luke. Everybody say Dr. Luke. He was a doctor, very fastidious, and he wrote also in another book, the book of Luke. So we have Luke and Acts written by Dr. Luke. Now, Luke is one of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then there's John. The first three are called synoptic gospels. These gospels virtually tell the same story of Jesus, but it would be from different angles. So if you had three cameras following Jesus around, recording his life, they would be the same stories, but just from different perspectives. And then John is a little different. So he starts off writing to a guy named Theophilus. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. So Jesus died, rose, and then ascended into heaven. Until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions, through the Holy Spirit, to the apostles that he had chosen. These are the disciples. After his suffering, which we celebrated last week on Good Friday, everything that Jesus went through to pay for our sin, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs. So after he was resurrected, he, he showed himself to people that he was alive. He appeared to them over a 40-day period and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. So this resurrection was not a quiet resurrection. It wasn't like, I'm just going to sneak out of the back door real fast. He, he was there for 40 days. Matter of fact, some of you don't know this, 1 Corinthians 15, 6, after he was resurrected, he was seen by 500 eyewitness uh, accounts. So this was not hearsay. 500 extra people saw him after the resurrection. He said, some are still alive. Like Y'all can go talk to him right now. Some have died, but some are still here. So getting back to Acts chapter 1, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. He said, guys, do not leave Jerusalem, but I want you to wait for the gift my father has promised. What is the gift that he's talking about? The Holy Spirit of God. Jesus was going to leave, but he's going to give us his Holy Spirit. How many are grateful God will never leave us alone? He said, now you've heard... You've heard me speak about this. This is not the first time. For John baptized with water, H2O, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the word baptism just means submersion, you know? So May the 19th, we're going to be a part of the largest baptism recorded in history. We are called, it's called Baptized California. And you can register at our website because we are a site here in the Bay Area joining with hundreds of other churches, and we're going to all baptize on May 19th. Uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be so fascinating. So if you want to be baptized or if you know somebody that needs to be baptized in water, which just represents, it represents you identifying with Christ. Your life is here. You give your life to Jesus, and we bury the old you. Aren't you grateful for, that there's no zombie apocalypse with the old you that Jesus has forgiven. And then we raise you out of the water. That represents a watery grave, and, and we're raising you to a new life now found in him. I give you clear explana explanation because there are people who grew up in church. They see a lot of churchy things and have no idea what the purpose is. Like, why are these people getting in water? Why are they taking communion? Why are they lifting your hands? We're going to try to help you understand it all because I can't do anything if there's no purpose behind it. Okay, so 
He said, John baptized in water, which is, that's important, but then there's an infilling of the Holy Spirit. And he says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. What is a witness? It just tells what they saw. Period. We, we think it's so complex. He said, you're going to be a witness for the world, for what I've done in you. Don't overcomplicate telling people about your faith. It's just telling them what Jesus did in you. We'll start in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria. This is like their, their city, Judea, Samaria. That's the region and then to the world. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. These are angels. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem. I was thinking and praying about what to preach after such an enormous Easter weekend last, year, last week. And I began to think about what they must have felt after Christ had risen. I would like to preach to you based on the subject. Don't just stand there. Do something. Turn and tell the person sitting next to you, don't just stand there. Do something. You have probably heard someone introduce this phrase to you growing up. Don't just stand there. Do something. Now, I wonder if you can imagine for a moment the frustration that we would all have if everywhere we went, people were just standing there. If you went to a restaurant and people were just standing there. If you went to check in at the airport, and people were just standing there. If you went to a sports game and people were just standing there, can you imagine nothing would get accomplished and how frustrated we would all be? Well, long before my mom ever introduced me to this phrase, two angels told the disciples after the resurrection of Christ, don't just stand there, do something. That wasn't their exact words, but that was their message. Jesus told his disciples, guys, go wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And he says, in essence, I'm going to give you my presence. I'm going to equip you, and I'm going to give you the power to do what I'm asking of you. Now, we are waiting for the return of Christ, and how many are beginning to feel like these might be the end times? End times meaning the culmination of all of existence with the wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines, all of these things that have been prophesied in the scriptures thousands of years ago. And last week, we have the mission. We are waiting for his return, but we still have the mission that's unfulfilled for us. Now, let me just tell you for a second. Let me give you some great feedback and a report from last weekend, all right? We had eight services. This was, this was one of the most incredible unmistakably amazing weekends we've ever had. Easter was so, you brought your friends, you brought your family members, co-workers, you passed out invitations. Let me just tell you, all of the dream team who served, everybody who invited everybody, let me just tell you, get ready to clap. We had 8,500 people at church, but get this, get this, get this. We had 1,199 decisions of people saying, I now want to follow Jesus with all of my heart. Come on, let's really clap our hands. Are you kidding me? And not one of y'all could have found one more person? I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm so grateful. God has been so kind to us. What a privilege to serve that many people. And the percentage of people making a decision is one of the highest 
in America. From all of my pastor friends, we're, we, we all saw so many people come into Christ, but I just need to let you know, we're so grateful. 1,199 people made a decision to follow Christ. Now, that's because of what you did and the grace of God that showed up. I had a very clear definition and explanation of what the gospel actually is, and, and it was an amazing weekend. We went home tired, but we're like, man, that's how you live a day. Connected to purpose. Everybody's serving on the dream team. Like, we were tired, of course. But we were like, how else would you want to, would want to have spent a weekend? Yeah. Having said that, we can't just stay here. We got to get to work. There's 53 weeks till next Easter. 53, because Easter doesn't always land on the exact time, so it's, it's a different date every year. 53 weeks. What would happen? Can you imagine the impact we would have if all we did was stand here? We can't just stand here as, as a team that wins the Super Bowl. They celebrate and then get back to work. Out of all the Super Bowls recorded in history, I guarantee you there's not one player who's still standing in the stadium. Because you celebrate big wins and then get back to work. Now, here's what I'm going to... I'm going to just give you three points, okay? This, the three points, you could take these however you want, but I want you to just understand, you need to get motivated. You need to get motivated. I can try to do my best. My wife and I can try to do our best to, to motivate you, but I cannot, I can't flip the switch on in you. That's a mindset. It's easy to change environments. It's hard to change mindsets. I need your mindset to shift into, I'm now going to step into something. So this is, this is recorded throughout history of people finding their why. Why, why would I move from here? Why would I take a step? Because God has asked us to, and there's hurting and broken people all around the planet. Find your why. Find the why for why you would get motivated, and then stay focused and consistent. <clears throat> this is equally as important, because how many have ever been motivated and then didn't stay consistent, and you're just... Yeah. How many workout programs do we need? How many... Diets do we need? Like any of them would work, you know? If you just stay focused, stay consistent. Don't get distracted. Because oftentimes when we are motivated by the why, there are other little whys and what's all around us screaming for our attention. Don't get distracted. Stay consistent. Stay focused and be dedicated to being developed. We have a great commission, everybody. Don't just stand there do something. The disciples' lives have already been changed by Jesus. Three years they were with him. <clears throat> they watched him feed people, work miracles. Then they see him die on a cross. They think it's all over. They go hide. Then he raises from the dead. And then they see him. They're like, the deal's still on. What's going on? And then they begin to feel a little confused. At the moment, they, were, they thought he was here to overthrow Rome be an earthly king, and Jesus is like, no, 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 I'm not about that. I'm here to, to have a spiritual renewal and revival, and it's going to spread throughout the whole world. So they see Jesus rise, and then they're just standing there. We don't even know for how long, but apparently it was long enough for two angels to swoop in to think that it might be an issue. And so they come and reinforce the steps Jesus told them to take. Listen, everybody. Jesus told them, go to Jerusalem. And they're like, <laughs> jaw on the ground. Who knows? If the angels hadn't done something or said something, the, the disciples, they might have just started coming back every day, standing there looking in the sky. If it wasn't for the angels, some of them would still be there. <laughs> I've found that oftentimes we build monuments out of moments and miss the aim God used the moment to create. Let me say that again. I have found that oftentimes we build monuments out of moments and miss the aim God was using the moment to actually create. It's to create motion. 
It's to create movement. We are not to just stand there. We are to do what God's called us to do. You think about Matthew chapter 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus brings Peter, James, and John up to the mountain, and then Moses and Elijah appear, and, and Peter's so excited. He's like, <laughs> he always says the, the dumb stuff. He's like, hey, it's good that we're here. <laughs> yeah, no duh, Peter, no duh. That's what we used to say in the 90s. And then he says this, I'm going to build three shelters. I'm, I'm a, we're just going to stay up here, build three monuments. It's going to be amazing. And then... Jesus' face is so filled with, 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 with the glory of God that they can't even look at him. And when they turn back to look at him, Elijah and Moses are no longer there, letting us know Jesus is greater than Moses and Elijah, and it's all about him. We're supposed to learn and then get back to work. We learn and get back to work. Peter would have missed the whole message if, if he only stayed in that moment. If he would. And I get it. We are amazed at God. Don't get me wrong. We are amazed at the grace of God, the love of God, all of who he is, but we were never meant to just. We're not meant to stay on mountaintops. We are to go to the mountaintop, spend time with God, and then walk yourself down into the valley of hurting and broken people and point them back to the only one who can rescue, and that's Jesus. Where will the people be if we just stand there? Many people have missed the mission of God because they won't move beyond the moment. How long will you stand there gazing? Some people say it's all about the presence of God, just the presence of God. And so they build churches and, and it's all about the believers and it's, it becomes very inward focused. Have we forgotten Luke 15? God has some lost kids out there and he's called us to be on a search and rescue team. He's not just called, when we get to heaven, he's not going to just say, hey, did you enjoy my presence in church services? He's going to say, did you help me find my lost kids? Don't build a monument in the moment. Get in the moment. Get in the presence of God. And then you have to learn how to get back to work. What makes someone not move? You ever thought about this? What makes them not move and take the steps that God has for them? Could be fear. It's a big one. Could be doubt. They just don't believe God can use them. Could be depression. Could be a lot of things. Could be insecurity. It could be we are so broken, we don't feel like God can use me because I'm just, I'm a mess. Here's a big one. Self-centeredness. Ooh, that's a big one why people don't take a step to where God wants them to. Because they only approach God for what they can get out of God. And they're not asking God, how could you bless others through me? Here's some more. By the way, if, if all of your prayers were to be answered, would it only benefit you or the world around you? Let's break it down. If God was to give you that number, that financial income that you have been so desiring, would it only benefit you? Or would you take that to be a blessing to you, your family, and then others? If God was to give you influence, would you only use it for you? Or would you use it to benefit others as well? Here's some others. Uncertainty. People don't take a step because of uncertainty. It's a lack of faith. There's a lack of clarity. I, I, I need all the steps before I take one. Well, when my family and I drive to Disneyland, I don't wait for all the lights to turn green before I start moving. We just, we just get in the car and we... Some people are unmotivated. Some people aren't listening. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I wasn't listening. <laughs> How many sermons do you have to hear before you get to work? Some people are like, ah, oh, the Bible doesn't work. No, they don't want to work. Grace is free. Salvation, 
free. Jesus paid it all. But I hear, I'm here to tell you, growth, maturity, and reaching the world is going to take some work. Look at this. Like there is a mission field of, of fractured and shattered lives, and they will not be reached with us just standing here. The Bible says it this way, from him, Jesus, the whole body, meaning the church, joined and held together, uses it as an analogy, by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love. Watch this, watch this. As each part does its work. The disciples had just seen the greatest miracle, Jesus ascending. They're standing there and the angels are like, guys, you can't just stay here. Don't, don't just stand there, do something. And so what do they do? It's gonna seem trivial at first, but it was massive. Verse 12, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem. Let me explain. They went back to where Jesus told them to begin. In other words, they went back to the starting point for the mission. Does anybody remember four verses before this where Jesus told them to go? He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in. We thought it was just a city. It was a step where Jesus told them to go. Every race has a starting point and an ending point. And here's what successful people have in common, okay? Here's what success, successful business people have in common, successful athletes have in common, successful believers have in common. Okay, you ready for this? They all started. 100% of successful people started. Look at this verse. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord just rejoices to see the work begin. You don't have to have everything lined up. Just start. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Every day you don't start is just another day you feel stuck. Did you guys hear me in the back? Let me say it one more time, just in case my mic was low. Every day you don't start is just another day you feel stuck. Start. Start. Don't just stand there. Do something. We see Jesus. We worship Jesus. We listen to Jesus. But at some point, we have to follow Jesus. We cannot just stand here and do nothing. Here's the good news. The good news is all these disciples needed was a, as a very gentle, hey, guys, get going. And they did it. That's all they needed. Hey, guys, just start moving. Move along. And they did it. They went back to Jerusalem. They, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter st stands up, preaches the first sermon of the early church. 3,000 people get saved and water baptized, and the church is born. Can you imagine how much they would have missed if they were still up there standing there? Acts 1.8 is about influence. It's about reach. It's about impact. This verse is, is the ever-widening circle. Of, of influence. It starts with Jerusalem, he said, that was their city. Then he said, expand that circle to Judea, Samaria, that's the region. And then he said to the world, okay, listen, everybody, the gospel is not finished. As long as you have one family member who does not know Jesus, as long as you have one coworker, one person in your community, one person around the globe who has not yet heard about Jesus, then the message of Jesus is not completed yet. We have to completely widen the circle. I'm praying that you widen your circle. I'm praying that you're contributing to widening the circle. Make sure we're widening the circle, letting people know about the grace that we found. And this all requires us not just to stand here, but to do something. So, what step do you need to take? Start small, but start now. Did you hear me? Start small. It's cool. Small steps are cool. But start now. Here's a couple I'll recommend to you. You hear us say this all the time. Growth track at our church is the front door. It happens on the other side of that wall. It's where you hear the vision of the church and you actually become a member of the church. 
And next week, the second week, it's a three-week class, starts the beginning of every single month during the first three services. The second week is so fun. Oh my gosh, you, gotta, you owe it to yourself. You have to take this class because this is a gift assessment. Most people, if I said, hey, where are you gifted? You, you, they don't know. We'll help you find out like spiritual gifts because sometimes you have a gift of administration. Sometimes you have the gift with people. Sometimes it's something else. We'll help you find that. And then get on the dream team, start serving somewhere. That's everybody who serves. And then get in a small group. These are groups that are small. You can go to our website, shop for one. There's, there's a few hundred small groups. Just look for a different group the night you want, mm, the subject you want. Maybe it's, it's, it's jogging. Maybe it's exercise. Maybe it's Bible study. Maybe it's scrapbook. It, whatever. But just find one because you need to be in a group of people going the same way as you. Take a step. Guys, these are small steps, but start today. Like today, today. Do you know what today means? Here's some other ones. Read your Bible. Sean, that's so basic. I know, uh, but I still got to say it because there's so many believers who don't read their Bible. I'm talking about a systematic approach to read every day. Read the Bible. Then take some notes on what stood out to you. Pray. Talk to God. Spend time in worship. Throw on the Abide album that we made or your favorite worship and just worship Jesus. Then serve people. If you're struggling with depression, begin to serve other people. I'm trying to help you now because as long as you're self-focused, you're going to struggle with this. Part of what has broken that off of my life is just beginning to add value to other people. You add value to enough people for long enough, you will earn the right to share your faith. These are baby steps. Baby steps. Acts 1.8, he says, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit and you're going to, you're going to, be, you're going to be so powerful but the power is to be witnesses. It's courage. It's the strength. It's the ability. It's the confidence. It's insight. It's authority. Jesus promised you will receive power to be witnesses after you receive the Holy Spirit. Here's the progression. Receive the Holy Spirit. Then you'll receive power. And then you would witness with extraordinary results. A lot of times we try to take that and we shift it around and we'll try to reach the world without the Holy Spirit of God. Which we try to rely on our own gifts, our own giftings, our own strength, our own experience. We need the Holy Spirit to do his great commission. We can't reach the world on our own. We're not smart enough. We're not gifted enough. We need the Holy Spirit of God. And, and, and witnessing is not showing what we can do for God. It is showing what God has done in us. It's show and tell. Remember show and tell in elementary school? You brought your turtle or whatever. Hi, guys. I'd just like to share with you and show you. You didn't just tell it. You showed it. Let that be a lesson for every one of us. Guys, guys, share. Share what God's done in you. Just be a witness. Tell them what you've done. What has God done for you? Have you thought about that recently? What's God done for you? Is he, has he helped you? Has he healed you? Has he forgiven you? Like, like if you were to tell someone this week, what would you say? How would you articulate what God's done in you? And you've heard over the last few weeks the stories of God's grace. You've heard of marriages being healed. You've heard of people's lives being restored who are broken. We've been forgiven and radically redeemed by the love of God. Get your pitch ready. What is your pitch? How would you tell somebody about Jesus? Write it down this week. I'm giving you homework, everybody. <laughs> Write down how your life would be if you did not have Jesus who stepped in. Yeah. Write your pitch down. What would you say? Keep it short because we always want to talk too late. You ever talk to somebody, you say, hey, what do you do? And 20 minutes later, they're still talking and you have no idea what they do. <laughs> Keep it short. But just tell them, hey, my life was here. I gave my life to Jesus. Here's where I am now. Get your pitch ready. Because if we are still here, our primary role is to be witnesses. We can't just stand here. We got to do something. Look how overwhelming this great commission can be. 
without him. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Okay, that's pretty big. There's 8 billion people on the planet. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them. That takes some time. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded, the Bible. And surely he says, if you do this, I'll be with you. You don't even have to pray. God be with us. Just make his number one agenda. Your number one agenda. He'll be with you. And God uses ordinary people. But let me tell you, let me tell you this. God is so extra. He takes his extra and places it on our ordinary, our average, our regular, and he makes our reach extraordinary. When God instructs us, sometimes there are different groups of people. Some of us, we're running ahead of God. You're, you're, you're running too fast. Like, like slow down, bro, because God, he ain't even there yet. You're wanting something to happen today, and he's like, well, I need this to be worked out in you. I need this to be worked out in you. So you need to slow down a little bit. And then some of us are, we're too far behind. We're too slow. And God's like, man, you need to catch up. But there's a group of us. We're just standing there. We haven't taken any steps. And I just want you to hear in the kindest way I could just gently prod you. Don't just stand there. Do something. We need his timing, his power, but then we need movement to be effective. We need his timing. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, but then there's, there's got to be some movement. So don't just stand there. Do something. And not just anything. I'm talking about the something that God has called us to, and that is to reach a hurting and a broken world with the message of Jesus Christ. Don't just stand there looking at last weekend, looking at the resurrection, looking at what, who God is. Don't just stand there. Do something. Because these disciples took a step. Acts 17 says, these disciples turned the world upside down with the message of Jesus. How many are grateful? If God can use those jokers, he can use us too. Amen, everybody. Come on, clap your hands today. I'll end with this. Verse 11, the angels looked at them and said, hey guys, what are, you, what are you just standing there for? This same Jesus who you saw ascend, he will return in the same manner. Okay, watch me, watch me. All of history is not happenstance. It's not haphazard. All of history is moving toward this specific point. All of history is moving toward the return of Christ. And I want you to be ready I want when Christ returns that he doesn't just find us standing here. I want him to find us working, telling people about the love of God, using our gifts, our resource, our time, our talents, all of it to share the gospel that's changed our lives. Because he is coming again. And last week we celebrated such a great week. I just, I, I, I felt like the Lord wanted me to give you this sermon so we don't just look back at last week and I'm like... Don't build a monument out of a moment. Get moving. Get stepping.